In this video, we will be reviewing over the anatomy of the common rock uh, dove. Now, the uh, dove is a wonderful example to show the general anatomy of the, um, the aves without having too much specialization. One of the things we see with the grouping of aves is that this is the only grouping of animals to have feathers. Additionally, when we look at uh, birds, we see that they are endothermic, meaning they are warm-blooded. They have um, hollow type bones. Really, they're more honeycomb than hollow. They have a four-chambered heart. They have feathers. They lay eggs, and they have scales on their feet. So we will be looking at both the external and the internal anatomy of the aves using the pigeon as our prime example. We will begin with the external anatomy of the pigeon. First off, we'll start off with the beak. The upper part of the beak is known as the maxillae. The bottom part of the beak is known as the mandible. Both are covered by a horny sheath that grows continuously and is worn down with use. The external nares will be located in this area right there. And uh, these are the two nostrils and they're covered by that fleshy cera. You can see it right there. When we get to the eyes, um, each of the eyes has a lower and an upper eyelid. Beneath these is a uh, nicotating membrane or a third eye. The membrane is used to brush tears across the eyeball to keep the eye from drying out. And diving birds use this clear nicotating membrane as like a contact lens to help provide clarity of vision while underwater. And you'll locate this membrane at the uh, anterior corner of the eye. Now if we move posteriorly behind the eye, we will locate the external ear opening. And to do so, you will need to brush the feathers of the ear forward. Uh, the upper area up in here is known as the crown. Here we have the nape. We have the neck region right in here, or the throat. The breast region. We have the flank, the belly, the back area. The scapula will be located in this area right here. And then when we get to the, uh, the feet, study the skin of the feet and note its texture and the absence of feathers. Look at the top of the pigeon's toes and uh, notice the uh, position of all of the toes. And the position and shape of the toes can give a lot of information about the uh, lifestyle of the bird. Is it a perching bird? Is it a predatory bird? But it will give a, a great deal of insight. Finally, if you uh, look, in the, uh, look on the uh, bird's back, uh, just above where the tail feathers insert, you may find the uropyogenal gland. And this gland is used um, as an oil gland for uh, allowing the birds to preen their feathers. Now we're going to spread out one of the wings so that the various types of feathers are visible. The first thing we want you to do is to identify these primary feathers and these are attached to the bones of the finger and the wrist. Then we're going to move back and we're going to identify these secondary feathers which are attached to the ulna. And then we're going to move back and identify the scapular feathers which grow from the shoulder. And the primary, secondary, and scapular feathers are all flight feathers and are covered by a small ridge right here of secondary coverts and it's like, kind of like a little shingle of, of feathers. Then we're going to move back and we're going to identify the adular feathers which would be located right up in this area here. And these are attached to one of the bones of the finger and these fe feathers uh, are going to be similar to the slots on the leading edge of an airplane wing and it allows for slowing down for flight. Now what we're going to do next is pull out one of those primary feathers and examine it. So we have pulled out one of the primary uh, feathers and we're going to examine it. First thing we want to do is to locate this long slender hollow shaft. From the shaft you will note that barbs extend outward at an angle of about 45 degrees. And with your fingers you can gently pull apart those barbs and then you're going to uh, notice that they're formed of still smaller barbules and they have interlocking hooks. And so we can actually use the anatomy of the barbules and the hooks to identify and key out a bird if only a feather is present. So examine the barbs, the barbules, and the hooks 
and uh, make sure you can identify each of these structures. And I've got a, a um, enhanced uh, diagram over here that'll show you the barbs and the barbules and the hooklets labeled. As we begin reviewing over the internal anatomy of um, the pigeon, you'll notice that we have these large pectoralis muscles and these are attached to the keel. Uh, the keel is an extension from the sternum and it runs axillary along the midline of the sternum and it extends outward perpendicular to the planes of the rib and so the keel provides an anchor to which these large pectoralis muscles will attach and this provides uh, leverage for flight. Now because the uh, bird is designed for flight it uses a great deal of food uh, as fuel and so it breaks down the food very quickly in the bloodstream. In a human it would take 24 hours to digest a meal. In some of our birds we're seeing the digestion occur as fast as four hours. Now you'll see the crop located in this area here from the mouth we would have the esophagus uh, extending down to the crop and we can see that this uh, crop is full of seeds uh, but just going over the uh, the crop, uh, this is going to be attached to the lower part of the esophagus, and this is going to be a hard object. It's where the food is stored until uh, the parent bird can feed their young. So birds that uh, feed their young crop milk, this is where it's going to form. And crop milk is a mixture of lipids and proteins, and it's uh, secreted here as baby food for the uh, the young birds. Now the bird has two stomachs. We have one. And the first part of the stomach, the upper, is called the proventriculus. And it's in this part that digestion enzymes are secreted by glands that help to break down the food as it passes into the stomach. And then the lower part of the stomach is the ventriculus, or gizzard. And this is a tough muscular organ that crushes and grinds up the food, just like our teeth do. So remember that birds do not have teeth, so when they swallow food, they swallow it whole. And so birds may eat plants or seeds. Um, they're going to need to have a very powerful uh, gizzard to break that food up as opposed to birds that eat meat and fish. And so many times the gizzard may contain small stones or pebbles to help grind up the food. From the gizzard, the food will pass into the intestines. And the first part of the intestines is the duodenum. And then from the duodenum, uh, it will continue on down and finally leave out through the uh, the cloaca. Now the cloaca is a common exit for the digestive tract and the reproductive tract and the urinary tract. So um, you'll see a lot of our organs emptying into that cloaca. Additionally, you'll see the uh, the large liver. This is the largest organ of the body. Uh, the liver surrounds the gallbladder, and so the gallbladder may be difficult to observe, but if you'll lift up the liver, you'll see the gallbladder. And then uh, additionally, you'll see the uh, the pancreas, and the pancreas is an elongated uh, organ. It's found in close proximity to the, the duodenum and to the liver, and uh, the pancreas will secrete its um, product over into the intestines to help aid in digestion and absorption of the food. Here we can see the avian heart, and the avian heart is much like our own. It's a four-chambered heart consisting of two upper chambers known as atrium and two lower chambers known as ventricles. The bird's heart weighs up to twice as much of that as a mammal of equal size because of, of just the uh, strenuous activity of flying. And so energy-hungry muscles will need bigger, faster beating hearts to send them plenty of oxygen and nutrients. Uh, smaller birds and mammals that lead fast-paced lives can have a fast heart rate um, than larger ones. And the hummingbird has a heart rate closer to about 600 beats per minute at rest. The pigeon about 200 beats per minute at rest. Uh, compare that to an ostrich, which would run about, six, uh, about 65 beats per minute, and even to a human that would run about 70 beats per minute. Now in the throat region, locate the trachea or the windpipe. Now this is ventral to the uh, esophagus, except where the crop bulges out. And the crop will bulge out and cover it. Now I want you to run your finger over the trachea. You should be able to feel tracheal rings and that provides uh, a form to the wall. Trace this trachea on down to its lower end where there's somewhat of a swollen chamber. 
This chamber is a specialized internal membrane called a syrinx. And the syrinx is an organ found only in birds, and this is the organ from which the birds produce their various calls and their various songs. Now if you continue down past the syrinx, then you're going to see that it divides into two smaller tubes called bronchi, and each of the bronchi will lead to the lungs. And here we have the lungs. Now the lungs are relatively small organs, and so you want to look for two flat structures pressed against the ribs, lying on either side of the uh, vertebrae column, with the heart right in the center. Now unique to the birds is a system of air sacs that extends out from the lungs. And these air sacs act as a reservoir of air once that we've had initial inhalation. And this allows for a nearly continuous airflow ac across the respiratory membranes. So the air sacs act as an internal cooling system and they permeate the body cavity and even some of those hollow bones. Okay, now in your studies of the digestive system, you probably came across the kidneys. You will look at the kidneys a little bit closer now. So we want to locate the three-lobed kidneys. And uh, they're just below the lungs, and they fit into a depression in the dorsal wall of the bird. And then from the kidneys, we will have a narrow duct called the ureters that will lead from the kidneys down to the ureter. So note that the bird has no urinary bladder, and during most of the year, the genital system of the bird is going to be much reduced. So this reduced size reduces the total mass that the bird has to carry around. And so let's look and see what you would have if you had a male bird. Now if you had a male bird, you're going to see these uh, two white um, organs, and these are the testes, uh, the male reproductive organ. The uh, testes are ventral to the kidneys, and they may be slightly anterior to them. Uh, you may be able to see the uh, sperm duct that leads from the testes to the cloaca. Now, if you have a uh, female pigeon, you want to look for the ovary on the left side of the body. The ovary is in about the same position as the left testy would be, and the right ovary in the birds is non-functional. Here we want to uh, also locate the uh, oviduct, which should be uh, open close to the ovaries. If we trace the oviduct down to its posterior end, it will empty into the cloaca. Now the size of the ovaries and the oviduct will vary depending on whether the bird died during breeding season or during the reproductive inactive period. This one died during the breeding season. Now to see the brain, uh, you will have to make a sagittal incision through the skin from the cera near the, uh, the beak to the point just posterior to the skull's base. And you'll have to use a scalpel and make the appropriate lateral incisions at the beginning and at the end of the cut. And then you'll skin the head to expose the skull. Using scissors, you can cut through the bone that separates each of the eyes um, at the middle of the skull and then cut the bone and remove that to expose the brain. And so when you do so, we'll notice that here we have the eyes and attached uh, to the eyes we would have the uh, optic nerve going to the cerebellum part of the brain. We have the cerebrum here and we have the medulla. And if you would like to remove the brain and um, cross-section this, you can find some of the similar structures you would find in, say, a sheep or a human brain. Now let's examine the anatomy of the avian skeleton. The skeleton has been dramatically modified in order to facilitate flight. In most species, bones have become uh, honeycombed or hollowed out, containing air spaces. The bones of the limb have become elongated. Uh, the tailbone has um, shortened. The pelvic bone has uh, some fusing, as does some of the finger bones. And this provides a uh, rigidity and a strengthening uh, that's needed for flight. The sternum has this keel, and this keel is where large flight muscles will anchor. So the keel is the crest of the bone that arises from the sternum. And some of the flightless birds, like ostriches and emus, um, will not have a keel, or they'll have it greatly reduced. Now, additionally, to prevent collapse of the thoracic cavity during flight, we will have a pairing of three different bones the uh, scapula, the coracoid, and the furcula. 
and these together are known as the wishbone, but they prevent the wing and the thoracic cavity from collapsing during flight.